Hey everyone, how you doing today? We have episode number two with Anna Kelly. How you doing, Anna? I'm great today, Michael. Good to see you. This this topic came to me because my YouTube feed has been full of this concept, and and given that you and I came from very little to have more than we need, I thought we should talk about it. And that is the idea of secrets of the rich. When you hear secrets of the rich, what do you think? First thing I do is don't buy anything. The secrets are out there for you to find on our kind of our podcast and on information. So um, there are not secrets, but there are principles that wealthy people live by that can help you uh, create financial freedom if you'll understand and implement those principles for sure. Yeah. The first couple of things that hit me when I see things like that first, like you, I cringe. I'm like, oh, this is, this is going to be icky, right? I mean, it, it just feels wrong. So let's just talk about some of the principles you and I are not, uh, you know, we, we socialize with people worth seven, eight, nine figures really quite frequently. So they, they do think differently, right? I think about, you know, me before 30 and me after 40, and it, really my mindset has shifted as well. And a couple of things jump out. First, they very rarely, if ever say, how, you know, I can't afford that, right? That's not a phrase they say. In fact, Many of these folks I know could stroke a check for whatever the thing they wanted, but they don't. They talk about, hey, I'm going to go buy this or that office building or retail or, or apartment. That's going to produce the income that allows me to get that, you know, red Ferrari or whatever it is, right? They really do kind of daisy chain those things together. And that really leads to delayed gratification, right? They may want something. They may have the means to go buy it today, but they are willing to delay until some future time, which I think... It's very different because I didn't do that. When I wanted my white sports car, I went on and bought my white sports car. So that, that's the first thing. Yes, so, so, so true. And, and I agree. And that's really the one of the ways that we start to develop wealth. So while we might say, well, it's easy for them. They've got all this money. You know, they could write the check. Um, the way that you gain the wealth and you gain the, free, the financial freedom is really learning how to live below your means while you work to expand your means. And that's something that, that I still see very, very wealthy people. And even as I've created financial freedom where on paper, you would say I'm a wealthy person, right? We still are very, very careful not to live above our means. We live below our means so that we can continue to invest in things in the future that will allow us to you know, pay for our children's education and take bigger vacations once we have the cash flow from that next asset to do it, right? So along that principle, one of the principles that I, that really was a, a light bulb moment for me is that um, I, I took a, a financial peace university course by Dave Ramsey years ago. And it was the first time that I really learned anything about money because most of us, you know, and, and at that point, Michael, I was a financial advisor, mm -hmm. right? So I, I could talk about investments and how to grow your wealth, but I didn't know how to create my own. And that's one of the things that wealthy people figure out how can I create more wealth, not just set it aside and hope my investments grow, right? Mm -hmm. But the key principle that I learned was we have to learn to master money so that master money doesn't master us. And that's the thing that wealthy people get really good at doing is if they can delay that gratification and take their money and use it to grow future income so that then they can enjoy even greater things, mm -hmm. um, they will get much further ahead than someone that blows it the first time they see a nice car or yeah. blows it because their friends have a big house and they think they need to have a house. So if we blow all our money on things, the money is mastering us. Yeah. We, we don't have the maturity of that delayed gratification and, and the ability to say, here's every dollar that's coming in. How can I use it to now expand my means so that I can later enjoy all of those things that I really don't need, but that I want? Yeah, it's amazing. I still, Olivia and I have been financially free for years now, and I still track our monthly income to expenses and we still live modestly because again, I'm still, I still have plans for growth, right? We're, we're still growing. It's amazing that we we're so similar. So yeah, I guess the first superpower of the rich is they, they do generally speaking have delayed gratification. Uh, you do hear about the third generation just splurging and wasting it. But, you know, the people that made it, you know, one of their superpowers is delayed gratification. Uh, yes. The second one is, I think they think about time different. Now, you could say, yeah, of course, they have, a, you know, the checkbook and their bills don't bother them. But I really do think they think time differently, um, both in kind of where there's both where they're using their time, because the rich people still have Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Elon Musk will have 24 hours in the day, just like you and I. Yes. 
and just like you and I at 30, they do think about time differently, where their energy is, where their focus is. Uh, and now granted some of the, so you can think, well, of course they can do that. But I, I just think about me 30 versus me 40. And I was spending time on things that added no value to my life or my family, right? Whether that be TV or, you know, doing things. We, we don't appreciate the time that we waste. We, 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 we deserve or we relax. I mean, we fool ourselves a lot, I guess. Yeah. I think a couple things there, you know, it, it, within what you said, you know, one of the things is we, we do waste a lot of time and there's this balance between we want to enjoy our lives, right? So you don't want to just every single day of your life, 10 X and never enjoy relationships and the things that matter. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't, um, you don't need to, to slave yourself to your, your entrepreneurship, but you also don't need to sit back and realize I've wasted three hours today watching television, right? When you could be expanding your mind. And so one of the things that wealthier people do, they're constant learners. They read a lot. So if you talk to, you know, interviews or, or you read articles by very wealthy people, they always know they haven't arrived and they're investing their time into growing mm -hmm. um, and, and, and challenging themselves. And so they're careful about where they put their time, but also they've learned the value of their time, Michael. So, you know, in the beginning, I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll um, you know, use, use a child that I'm very close to, right? Who, who said, you know, I want to go get a job at this fast food place making 10 bucks an hour. And I said, are you worth $10 an hour? You know, and the, the person got a little like, well, of course I'm worth $10 an hour. <laughs> and my thought was, what if you're that, what if you could make a hundred dollars an hour with the things that I give you to do mm -hmm. that you think aren't a full-time job that's going to be 40 hours a week. But if you learn the value of your time and you, you make sure that as you're seeking deals or as you grow, you're growing your portfolio or as you're choosing a job and a career that you choose activities that are going to pay you the most dollar per hour for every moment of your time. And that's really, really important. And wealthy people master that. So I can guarantee you, Elon Musk is not, you know, doing his bookkeeping or doing <laughs> his own access to save money. Yeah. He's hiring other people to do that. And as I've created more financial freedom and I've seen how other people think, it's made it very easy for me to make much more quick decisions on what am I going to do and what am I not going to do? What am I going to delegate to someone else and not take on myself? Mm -hmm. And what can I do that's going to be the highest and best use of my time so that I'm doing what I enjoy and what's going to make me the most money with the least amount of time and effort to do it? Yeah, the last thing that I think about the rich and, and kind of, you know, the everyday average person, again, I use myself as an example, and we're going to talk about this a little bit or more in the third episode is a lot of the rich focus, like they're like Elon Musk, right? They focus on one thing until it becomes something bigger. They don't divide their focus, right? They don't, they don't in our world, right? They're not the multifamily person. They're not flipping, uh, you know, storage units and they're doing, you know, land they're building from scratch right they they i am this and they do that until they kind of arrive and then they diversify this is the whole multiple streams of income thing that's becoming popular but the people that i know generally speaking and i can only think of one exception made all their money in one hyper focused area before they went elsewhere yeah you know multiple streams of income is something that very very, very wealthy people focus on a lot, but a lot of times what they do to your point is they get really good at something and they don't just go completely the opposite end of the spectrum. It's not like they've grown up in real estate and then they're buying grocery stores, right? Yeah. Or, or they're creating technology and then they're, you know, deciding that they want to create pillows. Like they're adding something to what they're already doing where the incremental learning and the incremental um, experience they need to add isn't that far off. So it's kind of like, um, you know, if I were, if I were doing single family homes and I decide, Hey, I'd like to do a multi-unit, I could buy a duplex or a fourplex and do the same things to each of those units in the same building that I did on a single. And then, then maybe I go into a multi-unit and then, because I understand how commercial properties work, Maybe then I buy a self-storage building or a mobile home park. But if I try to go do, 
you know, go start a grocery store, I would be, I'd be starting from scratch. I wouldn't know what I'm doing. And I'd have to put so much time and money into it that I would lose the focus that I had on what I was really good at with the real estate. So a lot of times they take businesses and they just add something else to the wheel, right? So you've got the wheel and you've got these spokes to the wheel. You're doing one thing, you add another spoke to the same wheel so that it keeps going, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not until they have a lot of um, interlocking related income streams from the same type of business before you see them going off and trying to add something different. So the focus is very, very important. Yeah. And again, what I want to, what I would tell my younger self is again, for me, I was, I was an employee and that's what I was. My focus needed to be go earn as much money I can via commissions, go become the best at it, take speech classes, take technology class, do whatever you can to become the best at that because you're trying to increase the top line. That was my top line. It isn't go be a so-so employee, go get your real estate license and try to show houses during the day when you have breaks. No, 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 no. That's not what we're talking right. about, right? Go become the best yeah. at that. And then as you you grow, then 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 do other things. I, I think I think that I think again it's it's secrets of the rich, multiple income streams. These are all things that sound good, but the average person when they're early don't realize that it's going to cause more pain and distraction uh, than than it's worth. So I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, for sure. One other thing I, I just thought I would throw out there that, that it's important is that very wealthy people realize the power of leverage, right? Oh. Leverage, not just with debt, but leveraging everything. So they leverage other people to help them to get ahead. They leverage other people's money and other people's skills and other people's experience in order to help them to get ahead. They, they know the power of their network, right? So it's so important that you're not out there being a lone ranger trying to do everything all by yourself. In the beginning, I did that, right? And it slowed me down because I didn't trust and delegate, um, partner and hire people to do certain things. I try to do it all myself and save money, right? Really wealthy people know how to, again, it kind of comes back to the, the maximum highest and best use of their time. They know what they do really well and they stick to that, but then they hire or partner with other people and leverage them to grow their own businesses and to grow each other. And they also know how to very powerfully master leverage debt in order to get ahead. Um, they don't let the debt master them and they can become very, very careful. But you move from this point of thinking, all debt is bad. I need to live a totally debt-free life to start thinking, how can I master and leverage debt to create more income, to create more wealth, and to create more freedom? Um, and so it, it, it is a mindset shift that is unlike everything you're going to hear from people that aren't wealthy because they're living in a scarcity mentality. Live below your means. Don't ever use debt instead of abundance mentality. How can I expand my means and master everything around me and all the resources around me in order to, to do better. I'm so glad you brought that up because when I think leverage and I think about the people that I know, first and foremost, a lot of the rich that I know, um, they leverage time, right? I would tell you that some of the folks that I know that are worth eight and nine figures, they're, they're, they're spending, I don't know, I don't even think they, I, I think if I asked them how much time they work a week, they'd say zero. You and I might look at it and go, well, they're probably working eight to 10 hours a week. Right. The other, but the other thing it's back to leverage and no debt. I can't think of anybody I know worth eight figures that is debt free. Most of them have seven or eight figures in debt. Right. But they're, they're obviously yeah. on assets that, you know, pay for themselves quite easily. But right. yeah, I, I can't think of anybody I know that's worth over seven figures that's debt free. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I can't think of anyone. Yeah. And there's lots of reasons for that because having a debt completely debt-free life has a lot of opportunity cost loss, yep. but it also is a liability, right? Because sure. you can be sued and it can be all taken away. So the more your assets are kind of leveraged into other things, Encumbered, the less yeah. equity you have in any one business or LLC or property uh, that can be easily taken away from you. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I look forward to topic number three. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Anna. Thanks.